may remain seated. Grace to you and peace from God our Father, and from our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Amen. A portion of God's word for our encouragement this evening is from John chapter 13, beginning with the 21st verse. After he had said this, Jesus was troubled in spirit and testified, Very truly I tell you, one of you is going to betray me. His disciples stared at one another at a loss to know which of them he meant. One of them, the disciple whom Jesus loved, was reclining next to him. Simon Peter motioned to this disciple and said, Ask him which one he means. Leaning back against Jesus, he asked him, Lord, who is it? Jesus answered, It is the one to whom I will give this piece of bread when I have dipped it in the dish. Then dipping the piece of bread, he gave it to Judas, the son of Simon Iscariot. As soon as Judas took the bread, Satan entered into him. So Jesus told him, What you are about to do, do quickly. But no one at the meal understood why Jesus said this to him. Since Judas had charge of the money, some thought Jesus was telling him to buy what was needed for the festival, or to give something to the poor. As soon as Judas had taken the, taken the bread, he went out, and it was night. In the name of our Savior, Jesus Christ, dear friends. I suppose you could call him the Benedict Arnold of the Old Testament. His name was Ahithophel. He was a member of King David's cabinet. He was a confidant, an advisor, a friend. He dined at David's table. But when one of David's sons, Absalom, decided to have a coup, tried to become king, Ahithophel turned away from David and went to the side of Absalom. In one of his sons, David said, Even my close friend, someone I trusted, who shared my bread, has turned against me. You probably don't know too much about the hit fell. It's not somebody we talk about in our Sunday school lessons. But that passage becomes important hundreds of years later. Fast forward to that upper room where Jesus and his disciples are meeting for the Passover. Even my close friend, someone I trusted, who shared my bread, has turned against me. That passage is used to prophesy about Judas. We recognize his name, don't we? We know him as the one who betrayed Jesus. The one who was Jesus' close friend, his confidant. Somehow, I think, we get the impression that Judas was, that's just the way Judas was. Judas was, was always going to be the betrayer. And that's why people don't name their kids Judas anymore, do they? I, I have actually met one Judas in my life. Don't ask me why they named him that, but that's what they named him. But that's not a common name because it, you, Judas is equated with betrayal. And yet, Judas was one of the twelve disciples, wasn't he? It's not like Judas at age 21 or whatever, said, you know what my goal in life is? It's to betray Jesus. No, he was a disciple. Jesus called, called Judas to be one of his twelve. Now, we aren't given the details in the Bible like we are, say, with the calling of Peter and, and Andrew and James and John and Matthew. But somewhere there, the Lord called Judas to be one of his twelve. And when Judas sent out, or excuse me, when Jesus sent out the, the 12 disciples to proclaim his message, to do mission work. Judas was there. He was a missionary. 
When Jesus sent out the 12 disciples and 60 others, 72, to do mission work. Judas was one of the 72. He was doing mission work. So then the question becomes, well then, what happened? How did Judas go from one of the 12 to the one we now know, and as the Bible always states, Judas Iscariot, the one who betrayed Jesus? Well, let's go back to the first part of our reading, our gospel reading for tonight from Mark 14. A woman who comes and pours perfume on Jesus. Expensive perfume. Perfume worth a year's wages. And we're told some of the people there scolded her, rebuked her, and pointed out, this is a waste. What a waste of, of good perfume. What a waste of good money. It could have been sold, given to the poor. Well, John tells us that Judas was the one who was scolding her. And we're told he did not say this because he cared about the poor, but because he was a thief. As keeper of the money bag, he used to help himself to what was put into it. <coughs> Judas was the treasurer of the group. I suppose people would give a little bit of money here and there to help the disciples with food and their daily needs. And Judas was the one in charge of the money. Unfortunately, greed got, his greed got the better of him, and he would dip his hand into the, into the money bag and use it as his own personal piggy bank. Once he was down that road, it was easy for the devil to start whispering in his ear and saying things, I suppose, like, Judas, think what you could do if you had more money to work with. You're, this is just penny and dime stuff here. Imagine if you could get more money. And we're told, notice right after that event, we're told Judas decided to talk to the religious leaders to see if they would pay him to betray his Savior. It was pure and simple, plain old greed that caused Judas to eventually betray his Lord. We told the evening meal was in progress and the devil had already prompted Judas to betray Jesus. It was garden variety greed, unrepented and unchecked, that led Judas to become the betrayer. To betray his friend, his Savior, whether Judas believed that anymore or not, but still, Jesus was his Savior. And yet, the only one who knew that at this point was Jesus himself. Because betrayal often, like a lot of secrets, is done, or like a lot of sins, is done in secret. Judas led a double life. All the friends, all his disciples looked at him as an, an ally, a friend. One of the disciples, one of the twelve. And yet, Jesus knew. Jesus was troubled in spirit and testified, Truly I tell you, one of you is going to betray me. Notice the disciples reacted, I suppose, the same way as just about anyone reacts when they're accused of something. They were defensive. They denied and they deflected. His disciples stared at one another at a loss to know which of them he meant. Surely you don't mean me, Lord. Surely not I, Lord. Surely not I, Lord. Lord, surely not me. It causes them to look in, into them 
themselves and ask some questions. What does Jesus know? Does he know that I could do something like this? He's, certainly he's holy, he knows everything. What does he see in, in me that even I don't see? Am I capable of doing something like this? Am I capable of betraying him? Well, are we? Are we? Are we capable of betraying our Lord? It's easy for us to point fingers at Judas. But we aren't any better, are we? What secret sins cause us to betray the Lord on a regular basis? Those sins that are so well hidden from everyone, except the Lord, of course. What sins cause us to live a double life. What do we betray the Lord Jesus for? Is it greed that we betray him? For money? Do we betray him for pleasure? Do we betray him for lust? Do we betray him for any number of other sins? Because that's really what sin is, isn't it? Is, isn't it? A betrayal. Especially for us as Christians, we, we are followers of the Lord. And we want to serve the Lord. And, and yes, we part of us, our, our, our spirit from side one, we want to serve our Lord. And yet, we still have that sinful nature, don't we? That sinful nature that causes us to turn away from the Lord in those certain areas that, and the devil knows, doesn't he? The devil knows exactly what our weak spots are. He's not a dummy. He knows what works. And, he, and he's not that creative either, let's be honest, because he doesn't have to be. He can use the same old temptation over and over and over and over again because all too often it seems to work. So, what do we do? Do we end up like Judas and Ahithophel, both of whom committed suicide? Well, that's not the answer, is it? No, that's not the answer. Paul tells us in Galatians, brothers and sisters, if someone is caught in a sin, restore that person gently. That's certainly what Jesus tried to do with Judas. There are at least three times recorded in the Bible, where Jesus publicly rebuked Judas in front of the other twelve. Earlier in his, in his ministry, when he uh, is speaking the Bread of Life sermon, he says, Have I not chosen you, the twelve? Yet one of you is the devil. And then earlier, in this same upper room, after he has washed their feet, he says, You are clean, though not every one of you. And then, of course, he says, here, one of you will betray me, the one who dips the bread with me. Jesus is still reaching out to Jews, trying to unloosen that grip of greed that Judas has. Unfortunately, Judas didn't turn back to the Lord. But Jesus went to the cross in just a matter of hours after all of this. And there he suffered the punishment for Judas's betrayal, my betrayal, your betrayal. and all the other sins that we have committed, that the people of his day committed, that the people before him committed, that, that all people until the end of 
time will commit. And on the cross, Jesus said, My God, my God, why have you abandoned me? Jesus had to suffer the sins of betrayal. He had to be forsaken by his Father just for a time in order to take the punishment of hell upon himself. The punishment, the eternal punishment that we deserve for our betrayal. But Jesus paid for our sins, didn't he? It is finished, he says at the end. My pain for the sins of all people, for their betrayal, their denial, their lust, their greed, their lovelessness, their indifference, the punishment and the payment for all those sins, paid in full, it is finished. There's no reason for us to despair, no reason for us to turn away from the Lord and stay turned away from the Lord like Ahithophel and Jews. Yes, we lift up our hands of betrayal also. But we lift up our hands in joy and in prayer, asking that the Lord continue to forgive us, continue to strengthen us, Judas and Ahithophel didn't know to whom to turn. We do. We turn, we turn to our Lord and Savior, Savior, Jesus Christ. Where is their payment for all of our sins? Where is their payment for our sins of betrayal? In Christ alone. Amen. Please.